It's the shadow awaiting us around the corner. It's the thought pressed against the back of our skull. It's the beast eagerly waiting to devour every human interaction. Violence. In our art, is the climax, how our end goals are so often achieved. Domination and subjugation of the enemy. It's pure and unfiltered. Nothing can hide when violence is present. As we regress back to the animals that we are, in order to confront the predator, we will all inevitably face. But even the act of witnessing violence makes one a victim of violence. For we're transported to the nucleus of dehumanization and are forced to explain that which is unexplainable. Artists attempt to transgress, to subvert, or even to beautify the destructive. This is a celebration of those attempts that venture into the dark edges of cinema and the insights it provides into human existence. Sometimes I'm like amazed by people. And it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling to look at when you read Shakespeare. You're like, wow, it means so much to me. So then how do we dismantle or disrupt the schizophrenic, hypercapitalist, consumerist, inhuman realm which exists at the same time that greatness exists? Violence in the arts obliterates physical and emotional boundaries. Yet we often follow characters who use violence as a tool for redemption. Most art justifies its usage. In the most archetypal genres, violence is rarely judged, and it's seen as the means to employ one's will or to resist another's. And it's in the conventions of genre works where this is often most visible. In The Lord of the Rings, the alliance of men, elves and dwarves is portrayed as honourable even when adopting a violent path. For characterization comes through action, and action is portrayed through aesthetic. Examining such violence, we see that there is no malice or malevolent personalization within their sword strokes. There's a means to an end in their inaction of death, and it's often a struggle. Whereas examining the orcs, the sadism in one's joy of violence makes it an intrinsic evil. Our innate belief is that violence should not be enjoyed, even if necessary. However, violence is often inevitable, and thus the action in itself is not evil. It's the context and the artistry of its implementation which categorizes it into some moral code, which is why even the stylized violence of the heroes in The Lord of the Rings is viewed as triumphant. The flourishes of violence are in service of acts of heroism, and is thus a celebratory thing. We celebrate the destruction of evil, even if it requires violence. Perhaps the greatest individual hero of our modern mythology is Batman, who embodies this sentiment with a moral code that is intrinsic with his very being. His usage of brutal violence is what denotes him as a Jungian archetype, a man who exists in the shadow of humanity's most destructive aspect, but his self-imposed limitations of not killing allows him to not sink into villainy. I'm no executioner. Your compassion is a weakness your enemies will not share. That's why it's so important. For violence can be redemptive, and cinema leverages extreme scenarios and intense visual styles to engage with the concepts that emerge out of violence, whether it's the literal demolition of societal structures or the symbolic disintegration of individual psyches. Most film aesthetics that require the usage of violence end up working toward a perfected style of its action. After all, action is merely the performance of a physical act. Directors must block and compose all actions to their utmost ability, including violent ones. In King Who's A Touch of Zen, editing and cinematography was completely reimagined for a genre yet to fully emerge. With hypermobile cameras, actors attached to wires, and a much faster rate of editing that would destroy cinema's golden rule, violence here becomes something elegant, a byproduct of one's own spiritual ascendance. Uh. 
A Touch of Zen is the first modern martial arts film and set the aesthetic for an entire genre with future films like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. The hyper stylization removes realism and thus a recognizable humanity in the violence to transform it to something otherworldly. The choreographed dance-like movements flying through the trees was all in service of its Zen Buddhist themes. And through this aesthetic, it challenged the preconceived notions of violence as a tool in storytelling and in turn had to transform the very language of the medium itself. For although violence will ultimately become an ethical discussion, its depiction in any visual medium will also inevitably require a discussion about visual literacy, composition, blocking, motion, the objective tools that a master perfects, and the idea that violence in cinema can be perfected must first come with the presumption that violence is justifiable, but then also stylized to a point where it works towards artistic mastery. Works like Ong Bak display the awesome visual flair of martial arts, filming in wide, unobtrusive shots, not cutting, so that the action itself is on full display. However, the films that perfected the brutality of violence in its aesthetics are the Raid films. There's not much that can be expressed in words with films that are so based in physicality. Both Raid films are pinnacles of what hyper-stylized, superbly directed, and a supremely talented crew can make. Each fight sequence makes use of its surroundings, with the terrain of an action sequence becoming a sandbox of violent interactions. The variance in scenarios, people, fight styles, weaponry, turns everything into a tool for violence. Here, violence is character, its story, its motivation. It is an excess of violence, with crowds of people crammed into tiny areas, to large-scale brawls between prison inmates and guards. And yet, as more mainstream films display violence without gratuity, the raid films excel in their bloody excess. But this is a film where morality never comes into the equation of the violence. In fact, in all of the films I've just mentioned, violence is merely a tool for a protagonist to master. The raid happens to have justifiable gratuity. However, most films do not discuss violence in this manner, and their aesthetic must be reconsidered as such. In I Saw the Devil, a justifiable violence transforms its character into an irredeemable subject. In seeking vengeance upon a serial killer, our main character, in the act of eradicating evil, becomes evil himself. Here the ethics of endless violence come into play. What is the end goal for the savagery we must bear witness to? We establish as evil a human being can be, Choi Min Sik as a psychopathic rapist killer, and we're not granted the mercy of being able to avoid his works. We see all his sadistic urges, and we loathe him. As such, by the time Lee Byung Hun's revenge is upon us, there is no more deserving receptacle for it. Yet when comes the end goal? We watch the almost sadistic levels of our protagonist's rage inflicted upon someone deserving. Yet for what purpose? Is it self-gratification? Divine punishment? The fact is that the violence from either side never ceases. It fuels itself. 
the answer of how we eradicate violence here appears to be more violence, and paradoxically, is also what allows it to persist. Hey, do you hear me? I'm not sure you hear me. Ah, it's really fun, huh? <laughs> Whereas in a film like Straw Dogs, its controversy and perplexing look at the nature of this kind of violence permeates its legacy to this day. After moving to a small English town, Dustin Hoffman and his wife are found at the mercy of the locals who have completely rejected them. The violence intensifies in a seemingly random manner, growing more and more threatening. We come to get this bloody freak. We're gonna get him. With your cooperation or without it. David, stop it! <laughs> the theme of otherness and one's own justifications to defend oneself come into question, but the type of violence that's committed within Straw Dogs has to this day left people completely divided on the film. In one breath, it appears a heroic depiction of vigilantism. We should revere those who resist violence by taking it into their own hands. In another, it appears to glorify the exploitation of victims. And in others, its bleak, almost hopeless resolve appears to point towards all violence being unnecessary. You know what happens if they get in there? They'll kill us all. There are suggestions from people who worked on the film that our characters perhaps subconsciously wish the violence upon themselves in order to enact it upon others. The fact is that there are those who worked on the film who believe that, and some who believe the exact opposite. Straw Dogs is a film with a complicated reputation because of its depictions of violence. Its very intensity results in a visceral action from the viewer that it bypasses our artistic lens and just like in the film, we view violence as an encroaching threat, completely other to our very being and utterly unexplainable. Firstly, you can look at Fritz Lang's M in its pioneering study of the psyche of violence, presenting destruction as something both feared and haunted within society. Verdammt noch einmal! Sind Sie ein verrückter Mensch? Aber Sie ihn schon auf der Straße schmeißen? Wie man sich erhalten und weine? Unglaublich sowas! And although possessing a different look to Straw Dogs, its aesthetic is still in accordance with its sentiments. The film's exploration of a child murderer evoke a deep sense of dread, but what makes M truly extreme is the way it shifts the narrative lens to humanize the very figure of destruction. Lang's use of elongated shadows suggests a spreading darkness of humanity, lurking constantly beneath our surface world, and its use of silence leaves us constantly on the precipice as to which of the two worlds will emerge dominant. The film's extremity lies in the moral ambiguity it forces the audience to confront. By turning the criminal into the victim of societal wrath, Lang reveals the corrupting nature of violence. Much like in Denis Villeneuve's Prisoners, it delves into the murky depths of moral ambiguity, where violence becomes a tool of both justice and vengeance. Where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? 
In a narrative that's as much about the psychological unraveling of its characters as it is about the physical acts of brutality, Villeneuve crafts a taut, suffocating atmosphere that reveals the rot beneath the surface of suburban normalcy, where destruction festers in the form of fear, loss, and the primal need for retribution. And every day, she's wondering why I'm not there to fucking rescue her. Do you understand that? Me, not you, not you, but me, every day. So forgive me for not going home to have a good night's rest. The film's visual aesthetic, drenched in overcast gloom, mirrors the emotional toll of its subject matter as violence escalates into a labyrinth of ethical questions. It's a slow burn building to explosive moments where each act of brutality is not simply shown but felt deeply. Acts of violence are often committed against the futility and rage one feels upon having a violence enacted on them and being unable to vanquish it. Violence in these films is in some way a byproduct of evil in an attempt to eradicate it. It's a way of making the audience feel vindicated, ultimately returning us to the idea that watching violence in one way or another is a cathartic experience. So what does that really say about the way we view things? Help me. In a film like Natural Born Killers, Oliver Stone turns the romanticized notion of the American outlaw on its head, delivering a chaotic descent into media-fueled violence. Like a psychedelic nightmare in constant overdrive, the film aggressively blurs the line between satire and exploitation, rendering its violence as both spectacle and critique. It implicates its audience in the violence and weaponizes its rapid editing, hallucinatory visuals and overt performances to transform the killers into pop culture icons. Yeah, you know, we respect human life and all. But if I was a mass murderer, I'd be Mickey and Mallory. We're woven into the very psyche of our two killers as society seeks to plaster their warped vision of the world outward and the aesthetic cohesion of the film breaks down. Projections emerge from the ether. Cameras appear in the diegetic space of the film. And the suggestion is that as a united society, our shadows will completely overwhelm this world of any kind of consistency. Here, the destruction is not only physical, but also moral, as the film challenges our complicity in the glorification of violence. Well, you can tell by the blood and carnage all around me that the final chapter in the book called Mickey and Mallory has yet to be written. The medium itself becomes a weapon, wielded with exaggerated ferocity to confront a society that consumes brutality as entertainment. Its extremity lies not in the bloodshed alone, but in the way it forces us to recognize the circular relationship between violence and media. He punched me, he slapped me again. He, um. I just, I just wanna say, you know, can we? But where Natural Bond Killers explores the media's romanticization of killers, Battle Royale dissects society's obsession with competition and survival, turning violence into a state mandated spectacle. Kinji Fukasaku's dystopian nightmare unfolds with a clinical detachment, pitting school children against each other in a gladiatorial death match. The violence here is systemic, orchestrated by a government intent on enforcing control through fear. Yet within this structure, the film maintains a frenetic energy, blending the innocence of youth with the savagery on screen. The extreme juxtaposition between adolescence and death makes each act of violence more harrowing, forcing the viewer to confront the fragility of humanity in the face of annihilation. The film's raw power comes from its ability to strip down violence to its most primal level. 
where survival instinct and societal manipulation intertwine. In Punishment Park, Peter Watkins positions destruction within the framework of political repression, offering a pseudo-documentary that weaponizes realism to an unsettling effect. Punishment Park, described by the US Senate Subcommittee on Law and Order as a necessary training for the law officers and National Guard of the country in the control of those elements who seek the violent overthrow of the United States government and the means of providing a punitive deterrent for said subversive elements. The film's grainy handheld cinematography places us directly in the desert, where anti-establishment youths are hunted down by law enforcement in a brutal Kafkaesque exercise of power. Here, violence is a means of enforcing societal order, a tool wielded by those in control to suppress dissent. The destruction is both physical and ideological, with the violence functioning not only as punishment, but as a spectacle designed to dehumanize. The administration has chosen to accept and exploit the present division within the country and decide with what it considers as the majority. Instead of a politics of reconciliation, it has chosen a politics of polarization. Watkins uses the pseudo-realism of his approach to critique the media's complicity in perpetuating cycles of violence. Much like funny games, it implicates the viewer in this system of control, as the audience becomes a passive observer of the horrors unfolding. Carrot. In this subversive exercise in deconstruction, an almost clinical dismantling of the tropes that define the home invasion genre arises. The violence here is not merely inflicted upon the characters, but upon the audience itself. Hanukkah manipulates cinematic language, breaking the fourth wall and shifting our expectations to remind us that we are complicit in our consumption of violence. This geht nicht. Gewettet muss werden. Was meinen Sie? Denken Sie, Sie haben eine Chance zu gewinnen? Sie sind doch auf Ihrer Seite, oder? Also, auf ihn setzen Sie. The film uses the very medium of cinema to implicate its viewers, revealing the voyeuristic impulses that fuel our engagement with violent imagery. Every act of brutality is carefully constructed to elicit discomfort, as Hanukkah strips away the escapism typically associated with genre films. The destruction here is psychological, Hanukkah dismantling the characters' lives congruently with our relationship towards cinematic violence. Anna schickt mich. Heute Morgen sind überraschend Gäste gekommen und du lässt sie fragen, ob sie ihr mit ein paar Eiern aushelfen könnten. Ich glaube schon. Kommen Sie rein. Warten Sie einen Augenblick. We all know that violence destroys, but what comes in the aftermath of its destruction? The decay of once stable structures and lives, societal breakdown, and the slow erosion of quietude and normalcy. In La N, Matthew Kasovitz creates a stark portrait of a society on the edge, where violence simmers just below the surface, threatening to erupt at any moment. The ruin in La N is systemic, as the film captures the suffocating environment of the Parisian banlieues, where disillusioned youth are trapped in a cycle of poverty and brutality. The film explores how violence becomes ingrained in everyday life, an inescapable part of the social fabric. 
The film's gritty black and white aesthetic reinforces the bleakness of this existence, with Cassavit's sharp dialogue and kinetic camera work mirroring the restless energy of its characters. The violence here is not just physical, but existential, as hope erodes under the weight of oppression. La N doesn't just depict violence, it shows the inevitability of it when society abandons its most vulnerable. It dialogues with Tony Kaye's American History X, a film that explores the slow and painful process of unraveling ideological violence. It's happening right here, right in our neighborhood, right in that building behind you. Archie Miller ran that grocery store since we were kids here. Dave worked there, Mike worked there. He went under and now some fucking Korean owns it who fired these guys and is making a killing because he hired 40 fucking border jumpers. The film's extremity lies in the way it confronts both the seductive power of hatred and the devastating consequences it leaves in its wake. Edward Norton's portrayal of a neo-Nazi seeking redemption is a study in ruin not only of a community torn apart by racial violence, but of a man destroyed by his own blind fury. Asshole, fucking Kabbalah reading motherfucker, get the fuck out of my house. See this? That means not welcome. Much like Mississippi Burning, the violence is personal, infecting families, friendships, and more importantly, futures. When we think about worlds that have lived through their violence, a film like A Clockwork Orange is the standard at depicting a society that has undergone such a complete transformation. The youth seek immediate pleasure through their search for ultra-violence, and the decay and vulgarity that surrounds the citizens is completely unnoticed and even subconsciously absorbed by them. You must be a great disappointment to you, sir. There's an extremity in the manner in which the world converses with its inhabitants. Much like in Takashi Miike's Ichi the Killer, there's an exercise in extreme language. Here, Miike uses the lens of ultraviolence to explore the darkest crevices of human sadism. In this world, pain and pleasure are inextricably intertwined, and the spectacle of destruction reaches almost operatic proportions. The film's visual aesthetic is slick yet repulsive, stylized yet grotesque. It perfectly mirrors the themes laid bare in the original manga. Miike dares the audience to look beyond the gore into the psychosexual complexities at play. So the film is less about the violence itself and more about how it reflects the character's twisted desires and motivations. He crafts a cinematic world where brutality becomes a form of communication pushing the boundaries of what can be shown on screen, yet always with a sharp awareness of its own excess. Even when violence seeks to disgust its viewer, it still allures us. It goes in opposition to the highly composed heroic purgatory, a film that portrays a profound sense of desolation through its fragmented narrative and haunting imagery. Set in a post-war Japan, the film explores the emotional and psychological impact of society grappling with the aftermath of conflict. <laughs> <laughs> the film's slow pacing and sombre tone emphasise the depth of despair and alienation experienced by its characters. Kuroki's depiction of a world in disarray 
reflects the broader societal disintegration, capturing the profound sense of emptiness and futility that pervades their lives. However, in a film like Martyrs, the very act of violent communication between the art piece and the viewer is more of an endurance test. In one part, it's a revenge story. In the other, it's a meta-analysis on the act of suffering. Following two women seeking revenge on a mysterious faction that tortured young girls, the trauma of violence manifests itself as a naked monster, hell-bent on consuming you. On the other hand, we see the perspective of violence from a vessel of its action. Can violence cause such victimization that a person must transcend the physicality of evil in order to retain humanity? In essence, to become a martyr. Martyrs utilize violence in a maximalist aspect because it is an act of breaking down the very foundations of the world. One must sacrifice oneself to save the world. In this sense, it's to expose themselves to the greatest depravity one can face. There's a theme of sainthood in Martyrs, which would bring us back to the original point of heroism achieved through violence. However, in this instance, it's the complete inaction of violence that such status is received. We crave the revenge sought out by its two justifiable protagonists, yet Marta suggests that one only achieves the pinnacle of humanism when one disregards it altogether. C'est si facile de créer une victime, mademoiselle, si facile. Nous enfermer quelqu'un dans une pièce noire, il commence à souffrir. Nourrissez cette souffrance de façon méthodique, systématique et froide. Any depiction of violence is often in discussion with the nature of the human soul, what it says about its victims and what it says about its perpetrators. And in Army of Shadows, Jean-Pierre Melville creates a world in which destruction is not defined by extreme barbarism, but by the slow, deliberate erosion of the human soul. In a minute, you will turn the toe to the mitrailleuse and face to the mur. Vous allez courir aussi vite que vous pourrez. Nous n'allons pas tirer tout de suite. Nous allons vous laisser une chance. Qui arrivera jusqu'au mur sera exécuté plus tard avec les condamnés prochains. The cinematic violence here is subdued, often occurring off screen. Set within the French Resistance during World War II, Melville's film is often concerned with the psychological toll of violence rather than its physical manifestations. The endless silence, the muted color palette, an austere direction mirror the film's emotional landscape, where destruction is inevitable, and it is in fact in the quietest of moments that it's expected. Army of Shadows shows us through its filmmaking that violence often exists all around us in a silent form. The brooding atmosphere evokes a feeling that violence is in fact occurring as we speak. It simply exists in the minds of people and their incoming betrayals. The human condition thus transports the world to a somber and joyless landscape. Army of Shadows uses restraint to amplify its thematic concerns, suggesting that violence's true horror lies in the way it erodes the moral fabric of those who participate in it. In Paul Schrader's Hardcore, which uses destruction as a metaphor for the loss of innocence, George C. Scott plays a father, and we watch his descent into the seedy underworld of adult entertainment to find his missing daughter. Turn it off. Turn it off! The violence here is more existential, 
with less traditional violent present, but the shock factor lying in people's acceptance towards the erosion of humanity. George C. Scott's character is a Calvinist, with very traditional ideals, who must for the first time in his life communicate with those in society who have not. But I'll give you some advice, Jake. You'll look like a nice guy. You want to take some advice from me? Start small. Start with a kiddie porno. Then work yourself up. The result is a depiction of a world which is so fragmented that in their own spheres, people never intersect. And so their languages are completely different. The only thing that thus becomes universal that they can enact on one another is violence. This depiction of moral decay blurs the line between reality and depravity. Just as Scott's performance moves between stoicism and derangement, Hardcore envisions how the human soul is torn apart by a schizophrenic society intertwining violence with obsession. That's not true, Jim. Oh, as a matter of fact, I think you're very close to the type we've been looking for. Oh, yeah? Well, uh, I've done a lot of good work, you know, uh, uh, shorts, features, no major roles yet, it's true, but uh, it's all been really good stuff. In a completely different direction is Noisy Requiem. Here, Yoshiko Matsui plunges us into a grotesque, fragmented vision of urban decay, where violence and ruin intertwine inextricably. The film is an assault on the senses both visually and thematically, using disjointed narrative structures and disturbing imagery to evoke a world in collapse. Here, ruin is depicted in its most literal form, the decay of bodies, the degradation of minds, the erosion of societal norms. It revels in the grotesque, but it also manages to keep a profound sense of melancholy. The violence here feels inevitable, a consequence of a society that has abandoned its humanity. The extremity lies in the film's willingness to show the filth and grime of urban life, using its stark, often shocking imagery to create a portrait of a world where violence is both the cause and effect, a cyclical process of destruction and despair. For in works such as these, violence can seem as though it's a cry for help, an action against the universe and the powers that be that allowed such evil to be present. The Battle of Algiers brought a documentary style to treat the reenactment of its real world events as an act of protest. For sometimes, violence requires the instinctive rejection from its viewer to get its point across. Such is the case of Men Behind the Sun, following the events of Unit 731. Japan's key experimental facility on germ warfare during World War II. The violence here is on a level so extreme and so callous that it borders on exploitation. However, by remembering that the film attempts to bring awareness to the realities that were suffered by people, then it doesn't even come close to how extreme the violence really was, because it actually happened. So what do we do about these kinds of depictions? What is the correct form? Is it an act of protest against history's omitted atrocities? If so, then wouldn't the film be better as a documentary, or simply showing real atrocities instead? Or do we understand fiction better? Men Behind the Sum chooses to graphically display the carnage enacted on the subjects in Unit 731. And perhaps this translates better to most of the realities of what really occurred. Because at what point can it be translated to viewers the reality of violence without it teetering into carnage for the sake of morbid entertainment?
It calls to mind Mikael Haneke's Benny's video and its meditation on the desensitizing effects of media violence. Like funny games, the film confronts the viewer with their own complicity, using the titular character's obsession with violent imagery as a lens through which to explore the numbing power of cinema. Hanukkah's camera work is clinical, almost detached, much like Benny's own perspective, which views violence through the distancing lens of a camera. Hanukkah's genius lies in his almost banal portrayal of a boy who cannot comprehend the real-life consequences of his actions. There is a meaninglessness to so much of the violence we see, and the approaches towards nihilistic outlooks are always on the horizon when examining them. In a film such as Elephant by Gus Van Sant, we attempt to explain or find the connecting threads between students that are about to be present during a school shooting. 11.30ish. Okay, Okay, envelope. Put your brother's name on there. Uh, is it Paul? Yeah, that Husband. I get it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> He's tall, brown hair. Oh, uh, right around 1.30. The film is incredibly spacious and dreamlike. The camera floats above, and most of the film is comprised of tracking shots following a character we really know nothing about for minutes at a time. And then, an unavoidable explosion of violence emerges as quickly as ends. The film is driving us towards the conclusion that there is a thread connecting normalcy to violence, but it's so ethereal that even when it's right in front of us, we can't see it. And we watch life and violence from a completely detached perspective, as though it were one of the many other mechanical actions we've just been watching. Inescapable, inhuman, and meaningless. All right, let's see this. So, we'll park here, right? And we'll enter through the south entrance, right? Then we go past the trophy case and the, metal, you know, the mineral case, we'll enter in through the language lab. No, they don't use it anymore, so there shouldn't be anybody in there. Often the violence is just present around us. Perhaps it is systemic. Perhaps it is callous. But for many instances, it's accepted without question. In the death of Mr. Lazarescu, a man is wheeled from hospital to hospital in order to receive urgent medical attention before responsibility being pushed away with no thought at all given to what may happen to him. Dacă vrei, ți-l ții aici și ți-l duc direct jos la crematoriu, că tot zice că e frig. E plin la neurochirurgie. Gata, time out. Da să ți mnez parafeza, tot în regulă. Not violence as we know it, but a violent action nonetheless, and one which we accept as part of our societal fabric. Is violence so part of our conditioning that it becomes invisible? This same detached clinical vision is portrayed in the controversial Inner Glass Cage, a haunting exploration of trauma and the cyclical nature of violence set against the backdrop of post-World War II. Clavé la aguja en su pecho y descargué la gasolina. La manzana resbaló de sus manos y cayó al suelo. Me senté tras la mesa y miré con detenimiento su agonía. Nunca hasta entonces había experimentado un placer semejante. Era como si yo me uniera en la intimidad con la muerte. The film presents violence as an all-consuming force, both physically and psychologically, as the remnants of fascist cruelty linger in the lives of its characters. The titular glass cage becomes a symbol of imprisonment, both for the former Nazi doctor confined to it and for the young boy who becomes his caretaker, bound by his own traumatic past. In the end, violence comes to permeate every interaction, as trust between individuals and even within oneself disintegrates.
And thus we reach the conclusion that in all our art and all our lives, there is some antagonism that we must face, some egregious act against humanity. Whether we like it or not, there will always be some violence. In Memories of Murder, Bong Joon-ho blends true crime with existential despair, crafting a narrative where violence is not merely an event, but a force that consumes all in its path. The film follows a group of detectives struggling to solve a series of murders in rural South Korea, but the focus is less on the mystery itself than on the emotional and moral unravelling of its characters. The film uses its setting to reflect the ruin inherent in societal failure. Here, the incompetence and brutality of the police mirror the larger social malaise. The film's bleak cinematography, with its muddy, rain-soaked landscapes, serves as a visual metaphor for the moral murkiness of its protagonists. In the realm of cinema, violence transcends mere spectacle, becoming a profound aesthetic language that delves into the neglected corners of humanity. Tyrannosaur is a stark examination of personal desolation and societal neglect. Set against a backdrop of grim urban decay, the film follows Joseph, a man battling with his demons while trying to make sense of the bleak world around him. Shut the fuck up! What the fuck are you offering now? No, man. It's just a private joke. You ain't shit it? You wanna give me a fucking laugh? Not really. Wait, no fuck up then! The film's raw, unflinching portrayal of domestic violence and emotional turmoil captures the profound sense of isolation experienced by its characters. Violence in Tyrannosaur is conveyed through its bleak, realistic depiction of everyday brutality, and the character struggles to find solace in a society so indifferent to their suffering. Paddy Considine's use of intimate close-up shots and the film's relentless emotional intensity emphasise the crushing weight of its story. The bleakness emerges not only through content, but through aesthetic. Whereas in Dogville, the medium is the message. I thought you were implying that I was trying to exploit the town. Oh, wishful thinking. This town is rotten from the inside out. Wouldn't miss it if it fell into the gorge tomorrow. Here, Lars von Trier employs a minimalist stage setting to explore themes of moral and emotional desolation. The film's stripped-down, almost theatrical presentation removes traditional cinematic embellishments, focusing instead on the brutal exploitation of grace by the residents of Dogville. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. If I have to work harder, longer hours for less pay, then I'm willing to do that. Of course I am. I just want to be sure that they wouldn't prefer that I left town. Of course not. The absence of physical walls and the bare set accentuate the moral void and emotional emptiness of the town. The violence depicted underscores the profound impact of societal indifference and cruelty. Von Trier's film invites the audience to confront the dark underbelly of human nature and the pervasive sense of abandonment that shapes the characters' lives. In a similar vein, Takashi Miike's audition starts with a seemingly mundane premise, but rapidly descends into a harrowing exploration of psychological and physical horror. <laughs> Initially presented with a calm, almost clinical approach, the narrative shifts to a disturbing climax, highlighting the profound emotional and psychological isolation 
experienced by the characters. Miki's use of stark, unsettling imagery and a gradual build-up of tension transforms the film into a nightmarish exploration of human depravity and the fragility of trust and intimacy. Much like David Cronenberg's A History of Violence, it examines how violence affects even the most seemingly peaceful lives, unraveling the veneer of normalcy to reveal a core of primal brutality. Sure, give me some coffee. Make it black. Yes, sir. Joey. And, uh, and your friends? They don't drink coffee. He doesn't uh, agree with them. Joey. It's Joey. You are. The film's central character, played by Viggo Mortensen, is forced to confront the violent past he's tried to leave behind, as his carefully constructed life begins to collapse. Cronenberg's direction, while often restrained, allows the film's violent outburst to hit with devastating impact, reinforcing the idea that violence, once unleashed, can't be contained. The extremity here lies not in the graphic depiction of violence, but in the way it tears apart the illusion of control, revealing that violence is an inescapable part of the human condition. You kill some of his guys, you take his eye. Jesus, Joe, you took his eye. Barbed wire, wasn't it? That's disgusting. You always were the crazy one. The suggestion made throughout all of these works is that violence is our default point and that humanity must emerge in spite of its presence. And so what if an artist wants to explore the depth of humanity? Not to teach, but to revile. To dwell in the pit of misanthropy because the world is full of hate. Then you get a film like Irreversible, a chronically reversed revenge story. After the brutal rape of his girlfriend, Vincent Cassell and his friend seek to find the man who committed the heinous act. Gaspar Noé's direction, however, is anything but welcoming a low humming frequency that plays throughout the introduction. The swaying, almost off-balance camera was supposed to literally make the audience feel nauseous. This is a film that's supposed to make you sick. A sequence of a man's face smashed in with a fire extinguisher, multiple sexual assaults, even Gaspar Noé talking about making the film under the influence of cocaine. This is not a film that excels in any kind of humanism. It's about the death of humanity from the inside and out with no solution. The perspective of Irreversible is to create a vision of a world that is inherently violent, that is violent first. What this means from an artistic perspective is uncertain, though in relation to its aesthetic, it becomes a film so fueled by cruelty that most people simply will not watch. Its antithesis is Krzysztof Kislowski's A Short Film About Killing. The theatrical version of one of his Decalogue episodes, A Short Film About Killing follows the murder of a taxi driver by a stranger and is an exploration of the commandment Thou shalt not kill. Proszę pani, czy to prawda, że ze zdjęcia można poznać, czy ktoś żyje, czy nie? Ktoś panu głupstwa opowiadał. The film's look is made of extreme use of color filters that literally warp and darken the image. There's an artificiality across the entire film as the image is literally being filmed out of existence. The struggle for humanity to seep beyond the boundaries of the image is the reason behind this raw, intense visual style. Our feeling towards the image, our inability to see, the discomfort caused by it, 
is the same as the humanism of the film. It's all there, but it's just holding on, just able to survive. In the realm of cinema, violence serves as more than a dramatic device. It's a mirror reflecting the profound depths of human suffering. It challenges us to face the shadows of our own experiences and the haunting echoes of human cruelty. In this dark reflection, we find not just the spectacle of violence, but a deeper, almost poetic meditation on the fragility of human connections and the emptiness that can follow moments of profound upheaval. Ultimately, cinema's engagement with violence as an aesthetic language reveals how extreme experiences can dismantle the familiar, leaving behind a stark landscape of haunting beauty. In this confrontation with the abyss, cinema becomes a powerful tool for reflecting on the nature of existence itself and the fragile thread that binds us to one another.